Well, this is number 13 in the series I've been doing, entitled The Simple Life. And of course, the basic text was Psalm 119, 130, which makes it clear that the degree to which we experience the presence and the light and the person of God and to which we experience revelation from God is going to be related to how simple or how complicated our lives may be. When the word there says that the entrance of God's word gives light and understanding to the simple, he's not saying simple-minded, but rather uncomplicated. So the degree to which we can simplify our lives will enhance the degree to which we experience not only the presence and glory of God, but the revelation that brings us the, the purpose of God, the power of God, and everything else. So, simplifying our lives, we have in recent Sundays, the last four or so, been focusing on relationships. Because relationships, probably more than any other single factor, have the potential to either bring blessing and progress to our lives or to complicate our lives with conflict and division and all kinds of soulish poison, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, but by the same token. If you manage your relationships properly, they will be the biggest source of the blessing of God in your life because God works through people. And so to the degree to which we understand scriptural principle about proper management of our relationships is really going to determine to a significant degree what kind of experience of God we have because he works through people. And so we've spent time establishing the truth that most of you know, that the relational mandate that sets us up for relational success is the love of God. We're told that love never fails. Doesn't mean you can manipulate somebody else's life by loving them or whatnot. They still have to make their own choices. But love never fails in the sense that it never grows old and it's always the best option for the kind of relationships that God can use in your life. And so, you know, we have spent time in past Sundays talking about how love is to look. What does it mean to love? It isn't simply an emotion, a soulish sense of affection for somebody, although that will be part of God's outworking of his love in your life. The kind of love that we are to engage in, uh, the Greek word, as you know, is agape, and it means to give. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth would have everlasting life. So essentially, we can understand that the love we are uh, talking about as a relational uh, provision given us by God to have the kind of relationships that are workable for him, to be able to use you in someone else's life, to be able to use them in yours, because, you know, he, he, he works through this physical, natural arena and human free moral agency. And so we want to be sure that we are managing our relationships right. That means our relationships need to be based on our commitment to use the resource of our life to meet another person's need, even if their need is to be met before our own. That is the God kind of love, and it is to be tendered unconditionally, meaning not only because you feel like they deserve it, not only because they've been nice to you, and so you'll be nice to them in return. This is unconditional. This means the person you dislike the most, God will show you how you can give something to them that will begin to break down that wall of separation that has stood between you. So love becomes an exceedingly important concept if our lives aren't going to be complicated to an unmanageable degree. 
by the animosity, the hatred, the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the list goes on. If we are to have the kind of relationships God can use, this is a must. But today, where I want to go, and I, listen, the Lord woke me up at three in the morning this morning, and I had to rewrite my whole sermon. <laughs> I mean, I spent yesterday getting this sermon put together, and I told them when I went to bed last night, I don't, don't know if I feel really like that's the path I'm supposed to go down. Well, sure enough, <laughs> three o'clock, bing, and, uh, and so I spent the next three hours rewriting this. And the, the way that he um, spoke it to me, and uh, I'll share some things that he spoke momentarily, uh, but it had to do with the fact that we have to receive the love that's offered. If you're going to love people, they have to receive that love to experience resurrection power. God so loved the world that he gave that whosoever believe, well, it's the same way. When you love somebody, and what are you, what are you giving when you love? You're giving, first of all, God, because God is love. He's the love that we're talking about. And God and his word are one. So you could be giving somebody the life-changing truth of the word of God. How we give varies. I mean, a lot of times we're giving without even knowing we're giving because our lives are written epistles, are written epistles, and people are watching what you do, and it speaks something to them about your viewpoints, your lifestyle choices, your experience of supernatural peace and joy and success on this earth. And it will affect people you don't even know about. Or it could be somebody in your circle of acquaintances that you speak the word to. And you're able to do it in a way that even if they don't want to hear what the Bible has to say, they don't need to know that it's coming from the Bible. That's what the Winner's Minute's all about. Amen. Most of the time, the things that I share on the Winner's Minute are just principles of the word that resonate with people's hearts. They know that it's true, but they don't know it's the Bible at that point. Some do, many don't. So when you communicate verbally to somebody the kinds of things that will help them succeed in life, and that's what you're giving to them. You're giving them success in life. That's the greatest thing love can do. And success of any human being is based in their covenant with God, if they don't have one, that's the first issue. If they do, then the word of God and its promises become relevant to every decision they make throughout their life. And your influence in their life to base their decision making on the principle of God's word doesn't have to be spoken as such. It doesn't have to be chapter and verse. You can just from your heart and they're being convinced that you supernaturally care for them. That's part of extending the love of God. And because they think you care for them, and hopefully they're right, you can cultivate that kind of compassion for people, then they're likely to listen to your advice, which they may not even know is the word of God. I, I didn't mean to go there right now. That's for another time. But we can understand that how we love people is not necessarily, you know, uh, just chapter and verse from the Word of God. But it is a conveyance of the love God feels for them through us. You can't do that if you don't know how much He loves you. Mm -hmm. So we spent time talking about that, a revelation of how much God loves you. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. And then He said, our love is made perfect. Hereby is our love made perfect. So the degree to which you know how much God loves you, you'll be able to love God and you'll be able to love man. The two directions our love is to take. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind. The second commandment, 
is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law. But your ability to love God or man depends on your revelation of how much God loves you. And we talked about that in an earlier message, how to position yourself for that kind of revelation. But the key that I'm trying to get to for this morning's message, and I still haven't even gotten there, is uh, that they have to believe. The people you're talking to have to believe in order, and receive in order to experience this kind of supernatural power that will lift them to a different plane of life. That's resurrection power. The precursor is the love that God extends to them through you, but they have to receive it. You have to have cultivated a certain degree of credibility in their life in order to influence them. Because it is going to have a lot to do with their opening their life to what you have to say. So I want to talk to you this morning about how to do that, how to position your relationships in such a way that that person will want to believe what you're telling them, will want to receive what God's trying to get to them through you. Look at 1 John chapter 3 for a moment. First John chapter three, we've been here in a previous sermon on, in this series. Verse 16 is where we focused our earlier attention. We have known and believed the love that God hath to us. That is the prerequisite for verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect. Herein where? Herein we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Let me say this, and then I'm going to elaborate. This is what God spoke to me at 3.30 this morning. The degree to which we are perfected in love will be demonstrated by the degree to which torment or fear is abated in the lives of those around us. Everything you do in other people's lives either magnifies their fear and their torment or reduces it. I'll read it again. The degree to which we are perfected in love, remember, uh, that happens by the revelation we have of God's love for us. But the degree to which we're perfected in love will be demonstrated when we are mature in love by the degree to which torment or fear is abated in the lives of those around us. When we understand that our relationship with other people is primarily determined to rid them, give them an escape from the torment that fear has brought them to that point in their life. Anyone on to say everything you do in other people's lives either magnifies their fear and torment or reduces it. When you reduce someone's torment, they're gonna to listen to you. They're gonna be influenced by you. When their relationship with you brings them a sense of greater stability, greater freedom from fear, worry, and anxiety, these are all forms of fear. Cares, anxiety, worry, that's just fear. God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, so it doesn't come from him. It is the enemy's tool because it's a form of faith. It's a form of believing. It's just believing the wrong thing, that the doctor's report is going to be right, 
that God doesn't care about your financial prosperity. You're going to have to live in poverty to be a decent Christian. I mean, all of the things that we fear, not having enough money to pay the bills at the end of the month, not knowing uh, that this report we got from the doctor's office, is that really something that I can believe and see God rectify? Fear and unbelief in the Word of God always go hand in hand. And every kind of torment a person can experience on a soulish level is rooted in fear. No matter what term torments you, it can be traced to a root of fear. And so if we are perfected in love and love casts out fear, which is what we just read, then when we love somebody, we will be reducing the torment that fear produces in their life. And when you think of it this way, everything you do in relating to another person is either going to reinforce their fear and therefore the torment they feel or it's going to reduce it. And when their association with you begins to reduce the torment they have to deal with on a regular basis, you better believe you're, me, buddy, you're going to be able to speak into their life. They're going to want to hear what you have to say because they have seen a fruit of their relationship with you that, you know, they didn't suspect was possible. A lot of it may come just by watching your lifestyle. If you're perfected in love, fear isn't going to be controlling you. They're going to see that your joy and your peace is not dependent upon circumstance. You're going to have a smile on your face. You're always going to have a word of encouragement. You're going to be a happy camper. And this isn't a natural condition in a fallen world that we live in. So you're going to have to get yourself squared away in the morning when you get out of bed if anybody's going to be able to look at your life and be encouraged by it. If you roll out of bed on, what, the wrong side? Uh, as the cliche goes, and you go to work with a scowl on your face or, you know, you're biting people's heads off when they say this or ask that, all you're going to do is reinforce their torment. I could spend a lot more time on this than I'm going to have this morning. But one of the easier ways to, to do this may be, this is what the love chapter is all about. This is how you increase someone's receptiveness to God. God and his word are one, so his word. Or you extend the love of God through your life to them. Uh, and you increase their receptiveness to all of this, producing resurrection power in their life. How? Well, uh, first chapter of, uh, or first Corinthians 13, chapter, I ought to know that by heart. I've been there enough. Uh, 13, four. And of course, you know, we might as well turn there. Because what I want to do is read it to you. And I want to read it to you from the standpoint of seeing how it reduces fear in somebody else's life. This isn't a comprehensive list of everything you do in order to extend the love of God. There are many other things that have to do with relationships that aren't spelled out in the love chapter. So this isn't a comprehensive listing, but it is a... a uh, a beginning of the kind of fruit your life needs to bear in order to bring reassurance and peace to someone else instead of reinforcing their fears and their torment. Charity, verse 4, suffers long, 
The word charity in the King James means love. Suffers long. The Amplified uses the word patience and endurance. And it means that you endure and are patient with people no matter where they are or what they do. Their behavior can be so counter to the Word of God that you just want to wash your hands of them. But you continue doing what you can do to love them no matter what they do. You endure their disobedience. You endure their offensive behavior. You endure their shortcomings. You be patient with them because you know that love never fails, and if you keep at this, you're eventually going to find a breakthrough somewhere. Now, if you're not patient, if you don't endure their shortcomings, if you wash your hands of somebody who doesn't live up to your expectation or who isn't spiritual enough to be on your level, whatever uh, you may want to do to... Uh, to lengthen the distance between you and that person, says to them that they're not worthy of your association, your friendship, or your love. There certainly is no unconditional love in that. And then it associates your patience and your endurance with kindness. I mean, you can't be patient in the God kind of way uh, and, you know, still act ugly. That's right. It means you be kind to people when they don't deserve to be kind to. And this is the hardest one for me sometimes. <laughs> when people absolutely do not deserve it. But then, you know, the Lord will jerk the slack out of you when suddenly you realize you don't deserve the kindness you're getting. But the patience and the endurance coupled with kindness brings this, this settling of a heart. Otherwise, you know, they'd be tormented by the fact that, that maybe, you know, being short and a little bit ugly is the way to manage you know, shortness and ugliness coming toward you. Or maybe, you know, um, their lack of patience with you means that you wash your hands of the relationship. <coughs> so you can see how this works to either magnify their torment or begin to moderate their torment. If you're patient with them and kind to them, that speaks of their value to you. But really, it's the value they have to God through you. And that reinforces something in them that needed reinforcing. And it, it begins to moderate the torment they feel. The next several things have to do with pride, arrogance, haughtiness. Well, let me get envy first right quick. Love envieth not envy, you know, coveting what somebody else has. Simply says to them, they don't care about you as a person, they care about what you got. And uh, they're either after what you've got or want to gain from you uh, understanding about how they can get it as well. It depersonalizes the relationship, makes it seem almost fraudulent. Because their interest in you is not predicated on your personhood, but rather what you have that they want. So it should be easy to see that envy simply escalates their torment, their fear that, you know, people don't really like them, rather have what they got. But then there's the, the pride thing. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Huh? Vaunteth, yeah, well. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Well, these are, these are all talking about your, the tendency to be proud or arrogant or holding up to people all that you've done. When you are verbal about everything you've done, 
all the great things you've done, and really the people that talk a lot about themselves in this way, are really, most of them are probably pretty insecure about their own self-worth. But what happens, someone that is constantly talking about their accomplishments uh, in a prideful way. This is what I, I was able to do. And even if we shuffle it off on God and say, well, God did this for me, you know, but I, I believed and I received, we usually bring the credit back to ourselves. And when you talk about yourself all of the time, then once more that says to that other person, you don't care about them. You care about yourself. That's all you talk about. And you've lifted, you've elevated your performance to a point where it's not likely anybody else can achieve that. And so it reinforces the torment they have to deal with. So humility does exactly the opposite. It invests its interest in somebody else instead of in what you've done. It elevates the importance of the other person beyond yourself. And you're doing that for their benefit. Because God has said we're all equal in Christ. But when you elevate what they've done, and you extol their accomplishments, you are eliminating torment in their life, the torment that they're not measuring up and that they're failing in this life. They're making, you're making yourself trustworthy enough to them to listen to. They want to be around more of this because it's having a, uh, an effect in reducing the torment that fear that they're not measuring up would otherwise bring. Goes on to say in verse five, that love seeketh not her own. And this is part of what being humble is all about. About looking for ways to help other people instead of help yourself. If you haven't yet visited us in person, please know that you're welcome to join us anytime. We have three locations for you to choose from in Brooklyn Park, St. Paul, and Rogers. Just visit our website for service times and directions. We'd love to meet you and get to know you. Thanks for joining us today. Tune in again next week, and as always, remember, God wants you to win in every area of life.